women uh, the world over may live very different lives, but uh, they are lives that are intertwined. And they're intertwined in the way um, that deal with matters that affect women all over the world, and they, that is to do with their families. Um, it's these emotions that captured the interest of the late Geraldine O'Loughlin, whose untimely death earlier this year is leading her family to set up a memorial fund for the women of an area called Chencha, which is in southern Ethiopia, uh, one of the poor, world's poorest countries, uh, a particular part of the world that's in the news at the moment and in fact yesterday uh, the United Nations declared the whole of the Horn of Africa including Ethiopia uh, to be a famine zone uh, which is a very very um, significant step uh, for the UN to take and uh, it's not a step that they take lightly uh, in terms of alarming the world um, to the unfortunate circumstances uh, unfolding in any country so it's not a it's not a, a tag that they attach uh, readily to any particular part of the world but they have come out yesterday and uh, formally declared declared the Horn of Africa to be a famine zone. Um, so we're, we seem to be almost back to square one in terms of um, in terms of that part of the world. But to tell us a little bit more about this very local angle on this story, we're joined in studio uh, by Geraldine's husband, Tom. Good morning to you, Tom. Good morning. Uh, now, Geraldine, um, just a little background before we start. Geraldine was from Clonaslee. Geraldine was born and reared in Clonaslee and lived for... 20 odd years in Rosen Ellis where uh, she was involved in the running of a pub and our children went to school in Rosen Ellis and then we moved to Carlo mm -hmm. where we had an involvement in in the, the pork factory mm. and the boys went to Knockbeg College and in the year 2000 then we moved back and bought a house in Kilminchy in Port Leisha. Now how did Geraldine become interested in, in a, an issue so far away? Well Geraldine in 1998, uh, all the kids were gone to various, to college and to secondary schools. And she took an interest and went back to college at that time mm -hmm. and graduated a number of times in, in life coaching and counselling and various things. And she was exposed to greater or lesser extent, uh, extent to underprivileged people and uh, got to become very familiar with difficulties be it at home or abroad and particularly at home sure and uh, then two or three years ago i got involved in in uh, one of the charities out in ethiopia and eritrea mm. and last year on the 20 last sunday in september last year uh, my eldest son keith and paul cycled in the sean kelly cycle to raise funds for uh, the charity and we all attended it, we enjoyed it mm. and that evening we decided that we as a family would take part in it this year. So you, you have five children Tom, yes. um, Keith, Barry, Kevin, Paul and Jean. 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 Yeah. So um, the, the family home was always a very busy home, there was always lots going on, coming and going. Always lots going on. It, yeah. was, it was a busy, busy family. Busy family. Yeah. And, and th this connection then Geraldine uh, made somehow with, with families and with women uh, in other countries, especially Ethiopia, so she had a great sympathy uh, for the plight of... of but she had a great sympathy but our sympathy would have been developed, if you like, locally. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the, sure. the interest would have been generated locally mm. by her involvement in, in committees throughout Leash and Kildare. And uh, afterwards, we got mass cards from people in Kildare that we didn't even know she was involved in. Yeah. You know, she yeah. was very uh, kind and caring and was very interested in how people developed. And I suppose, and you see the catchphrase on the Ethiopian place that we're looking at, where the life expectancy of women, that area is 41 years. Yeah. The average number of children is six, of which two, or maybe three, survive to be 10 years old. So when I was out there last year, uh, it was during a period where Geraldine was quite sick, uh, you know, it was harrowing to see them and to meet kids that had never known a day when they wouldn't be hungry. Well, um, for the listeners, Tom, to just paint us a picture, if you hmm. will, of um, the area that you visited. You, you went to this Chencha region, is that right? Yes, Chencha okay. region. Give us an idea what it looks like, the fields, the houses, the, 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 the towns and the people you met out there. Well, what? the houses are primarily single-storey houses with, uh, built with straw and mud and that to go to a point in the centre where just acts as a chimney. 
and there could be three lots of families in them. The house may be 200 square feet. There could be three lots of families and smoke, the smoke in the house, out of the house, the, the cooking outside. Mm. And um, the conditions under which they would be living would be... Most of their income would come from begging and getting handouts. Mm. Uh, where progress had been made in, in areas where... Vita had been previously involved in some of the monies that was brought out for the Great Ethiopian Run, which was organised by Gabriel Healy Selassie, mm. the one I took part in. Mm. And uh, the project from there was to actually put in irrigation in the land sure. and to supply them with proper seeds. Yeah. The seeds that they were growing were wore out, were diseased, and it wasn't possible to get a yield from them. So now if if to get two potatoes yeah. and sow them. They're proper with fertilised ground, yeah. ground with uh, irrigated ground. It's possible to grow 20 potatoes. Yeah. So instead of, this project is about showing the people how to work, is giving them the facilities to work and basically cut them loose after two years to do their own thing. And in those areas, in the areas of Chenka and right across Somalia and everything, where this work has been done, there's no famine. Yeah. The famine is where people just got aid, say band aid, yeah. all the aids over the years, where they just fed them, and then as food returned, they returned, and now they're as back bad as ever. So the difference and here is that the people in the region have been given the tools to support been themselves. Given the tools, yeah. and it's the idea is to cre- to create a sustainable livelihood yeah. for now, the family go, go ongoing. Now we, we we all have a we all think we have a good idea of what these places look like and the conditions in in these various places. Um, that's okay, Tom. T- take your take your time there with with your phone. Okay. We um, we all have a fairly good idea, Tom, of um, what these places look like and what the conditions are like. But you were there. W- were you shocked by by what you came across when you when you arrived there? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, when we when we arrived, we went to the city. I did this about where the 10 mile, the 10 kilometre walk was taking place. Yeah. And uh, you, an enormous amount of unfinished apartments and that, and the scaffolding that was surrounding them was just timber. Yeah. They were rotting, you know. Yeah. You can't say it was much different than what we found here mm. with unfinished buildings and everything else. Uh, the shops had very little stock. Yeah. Uh, there seemed to be plentiful supply of shops, with, mm. you know, say we're selling runners and some of the supermarkets and that. And then as you went to the edge of the town, that there was sheer poverty and uh, the conditions that people were living in. There was sewers running along the street. Yeah. You know, the first thing that struck me when I got off the plane was the actual smell. You know, it was something that you were living with all the time. And, and, and how would you describe that? What is that smell? Well, it was sewage, and identified immediately as sewage. And, and uh, mm. in the hotel that we were staying in, it was probably a one star or two star hotel. Most of the time, there was no running water in it. Yeah. You know, and yeah. the equipment in it, and nobody was too concerned. Mm. And then after the race took place, which was phenomenal, 45,000 people came to the race. Mm. Gabriel Healy Selassie, who was won, I think, three or four Olympic gold medals, he would be the guiding light of that, and right. he's running it again this year, and he generates most of his income by his factories that make runners and different things, sure. and the proceeds go into supporting families. Yeah. But we drove down then the 800 kilometres from Adidas Ababa hmm. to Chenka, and right along the road you see people just hunting five cows or four cows or nine cows and the far side of people walking back, you know, just walking yeah. if you could get water yeah, yeah. and to get water to walk back to their base, you know, and you see yeah. them carrying bodies on the road and everything and it's it's certainly something that you wouldn't want to come across too come often. Come across too often now, yeah. you know. Yeah. Weather 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 is not overly hot. It's the weather is consistent in like what we'd have as a good day here, maybe twenty three or twenty four degrees. Yeah. yeah. And the, the it, land conditions are very good. The the growth conditions, if they were properly uh, treated, were very good. Yeah. You know, you get good response from fertilizer if they were managed to get good response. And we had um, introduced system out there where, if a farmer and the average farm size is just less than three hectares which oh. is about six or seven acres yeah. but 
if we give them two bags of potatoes huh. out of the potato bank, because yeah. they don't have currency, at the end of the season, they will give us back four bags. Yeah. So in that way, we can multiply the seed as well. And it's just to get started, and, you know, that's our mission. Sure. Now, the fund you've established, um, you've established it in association with Vita. That's right. And uh, I believe we're joined on the line now by uh, John Weekliam. Is that right, John? That's it. How are you doing? How are you doing, Tom? Uh, if you just put your headphones on there, Tom. Uh, oh, I'm, on, I'm on a mobile, Adrian. I apologise. I got delayed on a train, which is nothing new in Ireland, and I'm standing outside the station. Yeah. <laughs> OK, well, thanks for making the effort anyway, John. Um, you're, 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 you're Chief Executive of Vita. For, for people who are perhaps not familiar with that name, it is a new name for an established charity, isn't it? Exactly right, yeah. We were well known as Refugee Trust, established by a leash priest from ba- Ballin Kill Father Kevin Doherty, a famous man who met popes and queens and everything, and Mother Teresa as the founding pra- patron who was a great friend of Father Kevin. Yeah. So that was in 1989, and for years we worked with refugees, but over the years we, we just came to the conclusion that aid and emergencies, while it's absolutely essential by itself, isn't the sustainable solution. So we felt we had to move into the area of sustainable livelihood, and Vita meaning livelihood or way of life was the, was the name we chose. We haven't done such a good job on the marketing front, I'm afraid, because mm. unlike some other charities, we, we, we haven't put the resources into that. We try to focus on delivery on the ground of sustainable livelihoods. That's our focus. And um, yeah, no, you're dead right. It's a new name for an old charity. OK, now Tom has his headphones on so he can hear you now, John. Great, brilliant. Um, t- t- Tom, just uh, tell us about how important it is for you to tie in with a charity such as Vita. W- why is that important for you? It's very important for us because the, the two options facing us was to set up a new charity of our own and the actual cost of doing that would be prohibitive of what we were trying to do. You know, Vita's a long-established charity. We met with them, as we did with others, and they said, well, listen, it's a small project we will administer it for you. We send out the money we administer it as part and part of our own projects. Right. If we were to set up the charity, get a charity number, we'd have to get in auditors to clear ourselves, clear everybody, and a lot of our money would be gone before we could establish it. Right. Uh, John, this idea of um, going into partnership, if you like, with local interested groups around Ireland, uh, is that something that Vita is particularly interested in doing? Well, absolutely. Well, I think the people of Ireland who understand some of the kind of issues we're tackling are, are honestly the farmers and the people who live in more rural areas who are very often in past generations, only one past, would remember problems with water and problems possibly with food and problems with electricity and all that. Mm. And it, it, there's a great understanding and we love to deal with farmers because farmers have such an understanding of issues. So um, particularly Leash where of course we originated, but also Kilkenny across the border and a few other places around the country where we have shops like Dundalk and we also have a good connection with Mayo. Um, we feel that that, that that local connection just gives such a grounding to the work and it's, it's almost like a twinning process because yeah. we want to facilitate linkages. We know that there are people like Tom and his family and his community who have tremendous interest in understanding and we're just trying to deliver on the other side down there where we have the infrastructure and, and make the linkage so that the two communities can get to know each other and I think it's a wonderful way of of bringing people closer together. Okay, John, uh, many thanks. I'm just going to wrap up here with Tom in the pro- uh, in the studio, but many thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks a lot, Adrian. Okay. Thanks. Okay, oh, thanks, um, John. Uh, Tom, just give me some details if people want to contribute to, to Geraldine's fund. How, how can they get involved? What we have uh, since given out leaflets there, a flyer hmm. which contains the bank account number, sort code and everything, which makes it very simple. People can pay off a laser credit card or ordinary bank account. Sure. Equally, they can sign direct debits. And the other thing in the short term that we're doing is uh, we're taking part and we have probably 35 volunteers to take part in the Sean Kelly okay. cycle. Okay. So we have sponsorship cards out and we're requesting people will sponsor. Okay, we're, we're talking here about the Vita Gold uh, Memorial yeah. Fund uh, in memory of uh, Geraldine and uh, Geraldine's family, including Tom, Keith, Barry, Kevin and Paul, mm. and uh, Garod Horan as well. Nephew, and, yeah. and Declan and Ivor O'Loughlin. Mm. Uh, everyone has decided to get, get behind this particular project. Yeah. And uh, the Sean Kelly event, um, that's happening shortly, is it? 28th of August. 28th of August. Okay. That's and run every year. There's an entry fee 
which goes, I think, to Crumlin Hospital. Sure. And then the excess is, is for whatever charity or okay. choice. Tom, I'll give out the details after the break and yeah. uh, the, the bank account numbers and all of that um, uh, information that people need uh, to get involved in this. Uh, but in the meantime, many thanks for coming in today and telling us about um, um, this fund to um, commemorate Geraldine and um, the work she started, I suppose. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. That's uh, Tom O'Loughlin there uh, telling us about uh, the Geraldine O'Loughlin uh, Vita Gold uh, Fund in aid of uh, the Chenka. I think I call it Chencha, but it's the Chenka region uh, of Ethiopia. Many, many thanks to Tom for joining us on the programme.